so nice to see you. I can't see the lights on my eyes, but I can see heads. <laughs> Look like brains, a lot of brains going on here. <laughs> looks just what it looks like inside a brain. Well, I'm very happy to be here with you, and I, I love to talk about this concept and this, well, this, this research that I've been doing for nearly 40 years now, and still doing research, still trying to understand how the mind-brain-body connection works. But I can honestly tell you that the mind is seriously the most powerful thing. You are 90 to 99% mind. Without your mind, nothing else functions. You pretty much, I should actually say you are 100% mind. You are your mind. There's a huge debate in the scientific circles and there has been for many years and also philosophers for thousands of years have talked about the concept of the mind and the physical and what are they and what's the connection and how they're related. In the last 50, 60 years, the mind and the brain have almost been seen as one thing. So when people talk about the mind, they think you're talking about the brain or they talk about the brain and the mind interchangeably. And they talk as though the brain is producing the mind. And that may sound logical, and that may be how you've been thinking about the mind and the brain. But actually, the mind is not the brain. The mind drives the brain, and the brain responds to the mind. And this is so critical because mind is con considered to be, understanding mind is considered to be the hard question of science. The easy question of science is, you know, how does the brain work, and how do neurons work, and how do all those things inside the brain and the body work? That's considered the easy question of science because we have tools to discover how they work, and we've discovered a lot in the last, obviously, 40, 50, 60 years. But when it comes to the mind, it, it's a little bit more elusive and becomes a little bit more difficult to study from a scientific or using scientific tools. But actually, I don't agree with that at all. The mind is not the hard question of science. The mind is the most obvious question, the most obvious answer, because the mind is you. Think about that for a moment. You sitting here, you're alive, you are processing what I'm saying, you have a life, you're going, to, you're going out of here, in, back into your life, your family, there's mothers, fathers, uncles, aunts, you, you work, you do stuff, you're responding to life, you're alive, you're living, you're a thinking, feeling, choosing being. That is mind. Mind is actually a very ancient word that is used for spirit and soul. So, and it's a very dynamic word, and we can see it all the time. We can see the result of mind right here now. The fact that I'm talking to you and able to talk about 38 years of research squashed into whatever it is, 35, 40 minutes, is my mind working to deliver the stuff that my mind has learned to understand. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's your mind that experiences the love you felt if you're a mom and your kids were giving you little gifts this morning. It's uh, your mind that is in your relationship. It's your mind that's in your work. When I get all excited about my research, that's my mind. My ability to talk to you is my mind. Now, I'm stressing this because it's your mind that is what you are using to experience absolutely every single thing in life. Your mind takes every experience and puts it into the brain because your mind needs the complex physical subst substrate that the brain is in order for the mind to be able to express itself. So the mind is how we process life, and then that gets put into the brain in the form of energy. Now, energy is what runs your computer. Energy is what runs your body. Energy is what runs your heart. Energy is basically the source of life. And as we know, God is the source of life. So therefore, energy is coming from God consciousness or Godness or whatever you want to say, however you want to, to phrase it. So all Job 32a talks about the spirit of life is in us. That spirit of life is our mind. So our mind is how we are processing things, and we all process things differently. So you're hearing the same conversation, but you are absorbing this differently. You are processing this differently according to how you uniquely think, feel, and choose. So what's amazing is about a thousand of you that are listening to me now, and you, I am saying one message, but there's a thousand different interpretations going on of what I'm saying. Because you're seeing this in your own unique way. You're experiencing this in your own unique way. Now, everything from the moment you open your eyes till the moment you go to sleep is being processed, and we're going to see lots of pictures on the screen in a moment, is being processed by your mind into your brain and your body, and then it shows up in your life in how you function. So experience, mind processes, puts it in the brain, and then the combination of the mind, brain, and body are how you then show up. How do you show up? 
You show up with your emotions, how you're feeling. You show up with your behaviors, what you say and what you do. You show up with your bodily sensations. Your body responds to how you are feeling and what you're saying and doing. And you have a perspective, how you're looking at life in the moment. So let's say that you're showing up now, your emotions are maybe anticipation, excitement, interest, confusion, whatever, bunch of emotions. Your body's sitting maybe a little bit sort of tense because you're leaning in to try and understand what I'm saying and how this, uh, um, how this relates to your life. So that's your body. Your behaviors are you concentrating, some of you are making notes, you're looking, you're um, paying attention, and your perspective is something like, okay, well, this could help me. This, uh, let me see how I can apply this to my life. So there's an example of how we show up. But now let's say that you're showing up with feeling extreme depression and having panic attacks and your body's in it, your GI system's packing up and you've got cardiovascular issues and your shoulders are tense and you're irritable and withdrawn and just not enjoying life and you look at, and your perspective is that life sucks. Okay, two different ways that you can show up and, that's, and there's an infinite number of ways that we can show up. But when we, the how we show up is in these four different categories of our emotions, our behaviors, our bodily sensations, and our perspectives. Those are four signals that your deep, intelligent, spiritual part of your mind that is connected to the source of life, that is God, is constantly working to advise you and guide you on the experiences that you've wired in that are affecting how you function. So how does your internal intelligent, non-conscious spiritual part of you talk to you through your signals. How does the spirit of God talk to you by connecting spirit to spirit and then showing through your signals how you show up? So in other words, what you're saying, doing, feeling, and the way you're looking at life are prompts directly from your spirit connected to the spirit of God telling you to pay attention to these signals because how you show up has a because of behind it. You don't just show up. You show up because of experiences in your life. So if your experiences as a mother are all just incredibly positive, and it's always good and bad in, in every situation, but if the overarching is positive, then you're showing up today in a very happy, positive way. And those signals are all going to be on the, on the positive side. But let's say that you're a mother that has had a lot of terrible experiences and, and has had been whatever, all kinds of negative stuff, then, and, and you're, or you're alone, or, which is very, it's, it can be a very hard day for a lot of mothers, then that's not going to be that person. They're going to show up differently. If you've been abused, you're going to show up differently. If you have a trauma, some kind of existing trauma that you've never dealt with, if you're battling with finances, if you're battling with what is going on in your marriage and work, whatever you are going through, is experienced by your mind, built into your brain and your body, and will be evident in how you show up. So what we need to do is to constantly look at how we're showing up and then evaluate, well, if I'm showing up in this way, where is this coming from? What's the because of? Now, those fourth ways that we can show up are called signals. Okay, the emotions, behaviors, perspectives, and bodily sensations. And they don't just float around. I mean, it's not just, they, don't just, they don't just happen. They are coming from a source. And that source is a thought. And that thought is the experience that you, your mind built into your brain. So life's experiences are built into the brain by the mind, and they become thoughts inside of the brain. And a thought looks like a tree. That's why I always use the analogy of trees. And trees have a root system, trunk, and branches. And that is what thoughts have too. Thoughts have the source, which are the, which are the roots, the origin story, what happened, and all that detail. And all the detail of that experience are the memories. So the roots are the equivalent of the memories of the detail of the experience. Does it make sense? It's the root story and all the details of the root story. It's not just one thing. It's all, I'm not just saying one word. I'm saying a lot of words. So the root of this experience it would be a, this is a healthy thought tree. So the roots there, there would be lots of roots, and they would be all the different words I'm saying and the, the, well, the different concepts that I'm saying. And you're building roots to capture all those concepts. And then you are processing through your tree trunk, and the branches are how you understand what I'm saying. But there's multiple roots and multiple branches inside this thought tree. So inside every thought tree, these multiple roots and branches are memories. So we have source memories, and then we have how we interpret, memories of how we interpret the information. 
And that sounds complex, but it's not that complex. It's kind of logical if you think of how a tree grows. You throw the seed in the ground, so that's the start of the experience. It grows into the roots, and then it grows into the trunk, and it grows into the branches. That's ha what happens to you. The source is this, as the experience starts, like as I started speaking, that's the seed. As I'm speaking, the roots are growing. And as, I'm spe as the roots are growing, at the same time, you're processing through the trunk and growing the branches. And then that influences how you will go and talk about this. How you show up is how you will talk about this and feel, etc. after this conversation. Okay, and I've laid, taken elaborate uh, attempts to lay a foundation for you to understand that when the scriptures talk about to bring all thoughts into captivity to love, because Christ Jesus God is love. Okay. That means that you're supposed to be doing what I just said a few moments ago, which is you should constantly be observing how your four signals, how you show up, because that will then take you to the thought, so you can capture the thought. And then what are you supposed to do with the thought? You are supposed to renew it, which means reconceptualize it, which means if it's negative and impacting you and, and your life and your loved ones and whatever, and your own mental and physical health, that you then need to work around renewing or reconceptualizing, deconstructing and reconstructing. You've got to do something with it. Otherwise, that negativity is going to keep you chained, and it's going to keep you caught, and it's going to make you all those signals get worse and amplify those signals. And then instead of depression and anxiety working for you, because they're actually pretty good, they, they are signals making you very aware, they're not bad things. But if they slip into the, if you don't deal with them, they get amplified, they get too big, and then they work against you instead of for you. And that goes for every emotion. All emotions are there, they're not bad, all emotions are good. They're all working for you and not against you if you're managing them. How do you manage emotions and behaviors and your bodily sensations and perspectives? Well, that's by observing them. You can't, you, we can't just keep going through, bumbling through life and just falling into patterns and thinking this is just who I am. We need to live lives of observation. We need to live lives of standing back and saying, hey, how did I just react to my husband? Or how did I just react to that email? Or how did I just react to what that person, you know, when that person parked in my parking space? at church? Or how did I just react when someone kind of, you know, gave me a weird look? You need to be observing because that's what we, if we find we have these patterns of getting worked up about certain things. That is a thought that is coming from an experience and if it is not healthy, it's damaging, physically damaging your brain and your body. So unmanaged toxic thoughts. In other words, if you don't capture those Observe like I'm describing and bring the thought into captivity. Capture that thought and manage that thought, which is the whole renewing of the mind process. You are increasing physical damage in your brain and your body and, that, and in the gravitational fields of your mind, and I'll explain that in a moment. And therefore, what you are doing is you are increasing your vulnerability to disease by 35 to 98%. So therefore, when we... Don't live a life of continuously renewing our mind and continuously capturing our thoughts and continuously doing these things we're supposed to do. We're going to be increasing our vulnerability and getting terribly frustrated. Now, I'm not saying that you, that you are supposed to never suffer. Absolutely not. You need, now listen, I'm not saying something bad. I'm saying something good. Suffering is part of the human experience. You need to understand and experience all the emotions. Jesus did demonstrate that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mental health is understanding that suffering is a real thing. That being sad or, or, or worried or terribly grieved by seeing the terrible things around you or grieving something that's gone wrong or feeling depressed because of what's going on in the world around you, that is not a mental illness. That is a normal reaction, a normal needed human reaction, part of your humanity to the adverse circumstances going on around you. But we currently live under a model of, uh, of a, uh, that we call the biomedic, biomedical neuroreductionistic model. And that, my, my, that mouthful basically is the fact that we are told that any emotion you have is, if it's not positive, if it's negative, it is a symptom of a disease. 
That is not science. It has been disproved. It never actually was proved. The research studies that have been done for all the past 40 years with that kind of philosophy have been re replicated and they have been shown to not say what they were saying. In other words, they've been disproved by top scientists around the world. In other words, the current psychiatric model that says that if you're depressed or anxious or up and down with your moods or having hallucinations or whatever, you will have a brain disease or a chemical imbalance or something like that, that there's something wrong with you as an individual, that you're broken, that you're a broken brain, that has been disproved. But that is the message that most people, 95% of people believe in the current, in our current zeitgeist. And that is very unfortunate because it's not accurate from a spiritual or scientific perspective, which is why I have spent the past 38 years doing what I do and why I still do the research and why I create the tools that I have, which are the books, and I have an app called the NeuroCycle app where it's literally me giving you therapy, helping you to learn how to recognize the signals and find the thought and deconstruct that thought and reconstruct that thought, et cetera, et cetera. So let's have a look at some slides to make this concept, unpack this concept a little bit more slowly and make it a little bit more easy to understand. So first of all, you're going to see a brain on this. Um, you see a brain up there. So this early morning doesn't affect your breakfast, I hope. <laughs> so you are not your brain, but this annoys your brain like a computer. A brain. We often use that analogy. Your brain is way more more, uh, more complex than a computer. We use our mind and our brain together to create the computer. So that brings us to the concept of AI, which I'll just throw in very briefly over here, artificial intelligence, which is where they're trying to digitize the brain, where they're trying to say, OK, well, what we can do is we can see how the brain functions on its most basic level, which is the neuron. And we can take that neuron. And if we can work out how it computes things, we can then multiply that. And we can create a computer that can do what the human brain can do. And eventually, we can have computers that are more intelligent than humans. I'm sure you're aware of this, chatbot and GPT-4 and all these things and um, artificial intelligence and it's, it's, it's very much, it's, it's all over the place in, 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 all kind, in all our technological systems. So it's not a bad thing at all. AI is not a bad thing. But the, what they're thinking, the thinking behind it is that they're saying that um, you, they can basically um, imitate the human brain and therefore make computers that are more intelligent than us. Now that will never happen. And let me tell you why that that is impossible. Because what they're doing is they're looking at that brain as though it is generating you, your humanity. So they're taking the brain as the ultimate source. But if you die, your brain disintegrates. If I had this brain in my hand right now, we could look at it all day long, it would never generate anything. No thought, no creativity, no art, no poetry, no relationship, nothing, no meaning. So therefore, it is a beautiful, complex organ, but it needs to be activated by something external. And what is it? It's the mind. Your mind makes your brain work. Your mind makes your heart work. Your mind makes your lungs work. Your mind makes your stomach work. Your mind makes your GI system work. Your mind makes everything about you as a human work. So you are not just your brain. Your brain, or nor you just your body. Your mind is embodied in the brain and the body. It makes the blood flow through your veins. It makes your genes express. It makes you making 800,000 to a million cells every second. And the quality of those cells and the actual ability to make those cells is dependent on your mind. The moment you die, you do not make 800,000 to a million cells every second. And what do those 800,000 to a million cells make? Those cells make up all the organs of your body and all the systems of your body, etc. So you are constantly, from the moment that you were conceived, multi and multi cell going through cell division, and you still are. And those cells make up your physical structure, and the quality of those cells is determined by your mind. And that's why if you're dead, no more cell division, no more cells, no more body. You getting this? So therefore, we have humongous and incredible um, complexity in the brain because the brain has to be, it has to be the, the structured in such a way that it can handle this very, very powerful mind. Because this powerful mind that we have has three levels. 
And the first level is the deepest level we call the non-conscious, N-O-N, the non-conscious mind. And that's the part of you that is your spiritual part. It's the most complex, the most intelligent, operates 24-7, and is con connected directly to the source of the highest level of intelligence. Okay? So we know what that is. Okay? So that's God. So that is your non-conscious mind. And you constantly, that, that's made the made in God's image part of you. And that is the part of you that you want to be constantly tuning into because that's where wisdom resides. Now, the only way you can tune into wisdom is, which, is, which I call the wise mind, is by standing back and observing the messy mind, the signals. Okay? And when you do that, you're then going to tune into what's going on inside the mind and the brain. Now, in the brain, what, we, what happens in the brain is that the experiences that we have get built into the brain, as I mentioned. So the brain changes. So you, when we talk about um, the changes in the brain, we can't just look at the neuron. Which is, uh, which is the thing that looks like a tree as well. We have to go inside the neuron and we have to look at what's the structures inside the neuron and we have to go in inside that part. And the deeper you go, the closer you get to what we call basically levels of energy. So to make this more simple, let's look at another slide, okay? The next slide is this energy that I'm talking about. So this is a real human who's alive, connected to very advanced brain technology. Um, and if we connected all of you up to the same technology, we would also see this yellow, orange, kind of like fire going through your brain. And what you're looking at here is the mind in all its levels, the, the deepest non-conscious part of your mind, that most intelligent spiritual part that operates 24-7, that drives you. Also the subconscious, which is the just aware level, it's the bridge between the non-conscious mind, and then the third level is the conscious mind. So conscious, conscious mind is awake when you're awake, the subconscious is only awake when you're awake, and the non-conscious is awake 24-7. Also, right now you're awake, so all three parts of mind are in action. This person is awake, so all three parts of the mind are being seen, reflected in the brain. So this person is being told to do something, answer questions, read something, talk about this, talk about that. And as they are talking and they've been shown things, they're having experiences and they're responding. So the brain, that's all mind stuff. So whatever they are experiencing is now being seen in the brain. Their response is being seen in the brain in the form of this color. And this fiery color is basically energy. It's different types of energy, it's electromagnetic energy, it's electrochemical energy, it's genetic energy, and it's quantum energy. And all of that, it's like waves of energy. All of you would have different patterns of this in your brain if, you were, if we had you linked up now to this, the same equipment. Why am I telling you this in so much detail? Because I want you to see the power of your mind. Because watch what happens next. As you're listening to me now, and these waves are going through, these waves like this see build and collapse, build and collapse, build and collapse at various different speeds and you start growing things. Now what you see on the screen is as the thought, as the energy wave collapses, and that energy is, is, is your thoughts, is the mind putting information into the brain in these, um, in these patterns of thoughts. And so as the wave collapses, it causes genetic expression, which means it makes a protein, and the protein grabs the information in the form of a special kind of vibration, which is, I'm not gonna go into all the science of that, but there's all these things called aromatic rings and whatever, so we can see from science that as a person is building information, they taking my words, you can hear words, you can see me, you can see images, but this is becoming a vibrational, aromatic type ring inside a protein, inside a branch, so all that waffly, waffly science stuff. Look at the pictures again. Look at this thing growing again. You are growing my words into your brain and changing your brain structure at 400 billion actions per second. Okay? And you don't only do this with my words. You're doing this all day long. So 95% of what you are building into your brain with your mind in this way, and these things that you see over there are these trees. This is an analogy of what you're seeing in there. They look like trees. In fact, the next slide we're going to show you, you'll see what it actually, there's an image. Uh, Max, let's show the glial cells. That we, we, Max is going to find you another picture that looks, okay, so that they, that's what it looks. If you look at, just keep it at the, 
neuron MAC, there we go, okay? So that's what those squiggly things that were growing, they grow into this kind of structure. Now the purple thing is the cell body and the thing that looks like a Christmas tree is this, over, is this part over here, it's this whole thing, the roots and the tree trunk and the branches and that's where your thoughts with all their memories are stored. And you have trillions upon trillions upon trillions of memories because you've had trillions upon trillions upon trillions of experiences. So your brain is filled with those trees and not only are they in your brain as these trees, as they form in your, in your brain as these tree-like structures, that's what they look like in the brain. Okay, so it's just different, those things that were growing look like that in the brain. This is the analogy of that same thing. You have trillions of these, you're forming them all day long and you will keep growing them till the end of your life and they're, they're basically your experiences. Okay, so those things are constantly in action in your brain. Now, you can control them. So, here's the thing. You can't control what's happened to you. Okay, your stories are always part of you. Good and bad. But you can control what they look like inside of you. So when we talk about capturing a thought, I'm talking about capturing those things that were growing and that look like these trees, and observing them and seeing, okay, well, these signals are attached to this thought, this is what I'm thinking about myself, the, the branch, this is how I'm seeing myself or seeing the situation, where does this come from, go to the source, the roots, and then that's what you want to fix up, you want to put plant food on the roots, you want to reconceptualize, renew the roots, and then the tree can grow out more healthy. So your story never goes away, but you can, you'll always remember what happened to you. But you can change what it looks like inside of you, inside your brain, and we're going to talk about the body and the mind in a moment, and therefore how it plays out into your future. In other words, whatever you've had happen to you, whatever is happening to you, whatever will happen to you, will wire into your brain, will affect how you show up. Early childhood trauma, all the ACEs, all those things, childhood trauma, adult trauma, adolescent trauma, will grow in your brain, will grow in your body, will grow in your mind in three places. In your brain, they look like trees. In your mind, they look like waves. And because your, your mind is this gravitational field all around you and through your mind and your, your, through your brain and your body, it's these fields and waves of energy. And also, they, will, they also build into your cells. Every single cell of your body has a memory of this talk that I'm giving you. Of every experience you have also goes into your body. So every experience is embodied by the mind into the brain as trees, as changes in the cytoskeleton of your cells, specifically called the microtubules, and also in the gravitational fields of your mind. If you didn't understand that, understand this. Every experience it builds, gets built in three places, your brain, your mind, and your body. Every experience. But they are constantly open to being changed. So therefore, whatever you've gone through does not have to determine your future. You do not have to live trying to cope with a trauma by turning to things like whatever, alcohol or drugs or whatever, that, those that's, addictions are not diseases. They're simply coping mechanisms. They're relationships. They are, try, they are ways of trying to avoid or not, don't, not knowing how to deal with the source. So what we have to do is create systems within ourselves, within our environments, our communities, that makes it safe for people to tell their stories, to recognize the signals, track it back to these trees, talk through how it's affected their life, find that source, get that source reconceptualized so that you can it, it, you change what it looks like inside your brain and changes the impact that it has in the future. That is what healing is, and that is what Jesus demonstrated in the Garden of Gethsemane. The best mental health model is the model that Jesus demonstrated in the Garden. When Jesus went into the Garden, Jesus was facing the issue. We cannot avoid, you can't drug or medicate your issues away. They are like volcanoes. They will explode. No matter how much you try and suppress, they will eventually explode and the hot lava will go all over your life. We have to deal with our stuff. We have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. We have to embrace all the emotions of life that go with what we have gone through in order to process and deal with it. And it's a hugely complex thing. This is not something that artificial intelligence can do because artificial intelligence only has been able to simulate one neuron. You have 80 to 100 billion neurons in your, in your brain. And, and that's just the neurons. They haven't even talked about the power of inside the neuron. If you go inside the neuron, there's a whole different, a whole different thing going on. 
So artificial intelligence will never be an issue. It's just very useful and we can use it to our advantage, but it will never take over our intelligence because there's an infinite intelligence inside every single one of us. The power inside one neuron is more than what we can even compute. And what they've done with AI is they've, all they've done is they've taken the external power of one neuron and they've sort of come close to that. They haven't even got all the neurons firing together. They don't even understand it. They haven't even gone inside the neuron. So there's no threat of AI. It's just something that we know, need to know how to manage and teach our kids about. But I don't want to, don't want to go into that too much now. I want to help you understand this, this basic concept. Okay, so wrapping this and tying this all together, you have an ability to deal with stuff. You have an ability to step back from the messiness of your mind, tell yourself it's okay to be a mess, look at the messiness, in the safety of knowing that you are amazing and that the, at the core of who you are, you're wired for love. We see that in our science. And then do the work of processing, reconceptualizing. So it's embrace, process, and reconceptualize, which means bring the thought into captivity and renew it. Now, because we're such complex beings and because we've had so many complex things happen to us, this is an ongoing thing. So mental health is not something that is anything new. It isn't getting worse. Um, it's always been a problem from the beginning of time, it's just different in every generation. Mental, uh, sorry, mental illness, um, the management of mental health has got worse. So that's why we are seeing a lot of increases in suicide and so on, because we're not teaching our kids how to manage technology. We're not teaching ourselves how to manage technology. We're not teaching ourselves how to manage things like AI. We're not teaching ourselves how to process our emotions. We're just being told, if you're sad, there's something wrong with you. If you're emotional, there's something wrong with you. You can't just take a technique and, and use a little trick and try and get rid of a bad thought. You have to, you can't just say, that's a bad thought, let's get a new, good new thought. You can't just swap a negative thought for a positive thought. It doesn't work like that. You can't just take a scripture and use it as a band-aid. You have to get in the garden and you have to face your stuff. You have to sweat through. You have to scream out to God. You have to get worse before you get better. You go for surgery, you get cut up to get healed. It's worse before it's better. You train to be a pro athlete, you're going to get sore before you get good. Okay? So we understand that with those things, but when it comes to the mind, we just want to get a quick fix. I feel bad, there's something wrong with me. No, there isn't something wrong with you. There is something wrong with what you've gone through. There's a huge difference. What is your story? And that story is in your brain. And yes, it has changed your brain. And yes, that change in your brain has also changed your body. And the longer it's there, the more you are increasing your vulnerability to disease, as I said. So one in two people, for example, in this country are lonely. And it's the same in Canada, pretty much global, globally. And you, loneliness itself is an experience that is processed by, into the brain with these images as you saw them and basically are changing how the brain has functioned. And so when people are lonely, their chances of getting dementia have increased hugely. Their chance of getting cardiovascular disease, their chance of getting autoimmune diseases, all kinds of diseases are associated with loneliness. All kinds of diseases are associated with trauma. Early childhood experiences, we have established the link between chronic unmanaged stress and physical ill health. But to think that one in two people are lonely in this country and that those one in two people are susceptible to getting dementia, why? Let's have a look at why. Let me explain these many different explanations I can give you, but I'll just give you one simple one. Mac, can you bring up the microtubules? Okay, we're gonna see a picture of these little tube things, okay? And these tube things are inside the neuron. Neurons are in the brain. Neurons are those tree things in the brain. If we go inside the neuron, we're going to get structures that are incredibly important when it comes to memory and thought and all that kind of stuff. And they look like little railway tracks that are rolled up. So those things that you're looking at there are called microtubules. The ones that are unwinding, you can see the little beads. Those little beads are called tubule and they're protein. Inside those are the vibrations of memory. So memory is inside a little bead and the beads all wind up and they are all put together in these little rows inside the, in the brain. They are stored inside the brain in a very specific way and then they look a little different inside the body. Okay, so what we want is the, mark, is the, the bottom one where you see it's all rolled up nicely. That is a good, healthy mind, a person who's managing their mind. That's someone who's saying, it's okay to be a mess. I'm, it's okay that I'm depressed. I'm depressed because of. It's, I'm sad because of. I'm doing this because of, oh gosh, I'm irritable. Sorry for snapping. Let me change that. That's someone who's going to have rolled up tubulum. 
Someone who's actually saying, I'm so sad, I'm crying, I'm on my knees, I'm in the garden, I'm getting feeling worse, I'm dealing with this, but you are not denying it, you are going through it, but I'm moving forward, I'm progressing forward. It's now worse because now I'm on the cross, but hey, wait, I will rise again with the wound in my hands. Okay? That is a rolled up tubulin. Okay, that looks like that in the brain. When Jesus sweated blood, it showed us the direct physiological link with, with mind. Okay, so we see all of that evidence. I don't have time to unpack that anymore, but you, you've got to get in the garden. You've got to go through the pain. It's okay. You do not have a brain disease or a chemical imbalance, etc. You've got to feel it to heal it, okay? And you will rise with a wound in your hand. The, exponer, the volcano will eventually stop exploding, and you'll have a dormant volcano. You'll still see the volcano. You'll still see the wound because you can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what it looks like inside of you and how it plays out into your future. So what about the ones that are unrolling? Well, those tubular are where I am suppressing, trying to take a, a drug to suppress, if it, uh, trying to think that there's something wrong with you if you feel an emotion, trying to deny that that's happened, not looking at your signals, rushing through life, just getting in these habits of just constantly not dealing with your stuff. You're going to unroll your tubulin. And when that unrolls, because they, these things form and reform, form and reform, and the and unhealthier that your mind, the more your mind, the less your mind is managed, the more those unroll, the more that you're setting yourself up for the dementias. And that's just one of the things. Those affect your heart. Every part of every system of your body is affected by those little things unrolling. And your mind is the thing that deals with them. When we talk about bringing thoughts into captivity, you're talking right down to inside the neuron, right down to the level of the DNA. Let's look at something that I did in my recent research search where we looked right down inside the DNA at when someone is not managing their mind and when they are managing their mind. So we're going to look at what we call um, telomeres. Telomeres, we're going to see a picture now. Telomeres are the ends of chromosomes. Chromosomes are inside the DNA of your cell. So a cell has a, has a nucleus and the nucleus has the DNA and basically the DNA has 23 sets of these chromosomes. If I pull that, if I took the yellow and I just pulled it like a, like those, like a spring, we would see all the DNA unwinding with your genetic code. Okay, so let's look at the little gold tips. Those gold tips are called telomeres. When I spoke earlier on about how your cells are constantly dividing, 800,000 to a million every second that you are making, okay, because you're alive. What's very involved in that process are your telomeres. So your telomeres are very, um, are very important. If they get short and weak, then the cells that you make will not be healthy, which means your body organs are not going to be so healthy, which means your systems aren't going to be healthy, which means you're not going to be healthy. And that feeds back into your mental health, and you kind of get this feedback loop going that's not great. But if you're managing your mind, you are improving the health of your telomeres. This is not the only thing. You're improving all other kinds of things. When you improve the health of your telomeres, you are improving the health of those little, those little beads that you saw in the previous thing, the tubulin in the mitochondria, that, those things that were rolled up and unrolling. So healthy telomeres equals healthy little tubulin rolled up into those in mitochondria little tubes. So all of them, and that, there's a whole lot of other things that are going on as well, but I want to take this down to a very deep level, that when you manage your mind, when you, you're affecting the telomere as well, so let's look at it in a very simple way. Telomeres, we can uh, tell us about our age of our organs, how healthy and how old our organs are. That's called your biological age. Your chronological age is the actual age that you are. Okay, so I'm 59, I turned 60 in a few months, but my biological age is nearly 12, 10 to 12 years younger than my chronological age because I am managing my mind, okay? And it's getting younger. Benjamin Button, going backwards, I like that, okay? <laughs> so the more you manage your mind, my kids have labeled me Benjamin Button mom. The more you control your mind, the more you manage, I wish I knew this when I was younger. I'm far better at it now than I was when I was younger. So I've been teaching my kids this from, my, the youngest, that I, my youngest patient has been a three-year-old. My kids have grown up with us, they're all adults now. And so you, I am bringing out a book, actually, this in, in August this year, and we're going to put up the slide if you guys want to pre-order. It's how to help your children help their child clean up their mental mess. So it's how to teach your kids, and you can teach a two-year-old. This is for three, two to three through ten-year-olds, and then we'll have the adolescent one coming out after that, although they can, they can use this book. Some of you may be familiar with this, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. So this one's on pre-order, and if you just... Take a photo of that, scan the QR code. We've got all kinds of pre-order bonuses. For example, I'm starting a private club where parents can 
can join the club and you can, I mean, it's a live Zoom and I answer your questions and help you through the process of helping you help your children. And then there's a private club for parents, for yourself, for, you don't have to be a parent, for just adults, where I help you manage your mental health through a virtual club situation. So if you, if you do the pre-order, you get the first month free for the club and then there's a bunch of other stuff too. But in here, there's a whole bunch of characters and I don't have the toy here, but we have created a little toy. I've created a character called Brainy. So you can, you can give your child um, an image. There's, there's coloring books and everything to help a child from young recognize, hey, mom, I th mommy, I feel sad. Or when they come home from school and they're grumpy and in the car and in a corner, and they're not very verbal yet because they're maybe two or three, you can hand them the Brainy toy. Or you can have the coloring book available. Or you can have this book available and say, do you want to point to the picture? Because it's filled with pictures. Guidance for you, guidance for how to tell your kids how to help your children. And um, the pictures the children can just point to. And then that's a connection point for you to start helping them process what they're going through. Helping them from young to recognize signals and get to the root cause. Helping them from young to bring a thought into captivity and renew the mind. You can teach this to a two-year-old. In fact, you, this is something that, it's a skill that we learn. It's something that you can do for the rest of your life. So the concept that I've developed to do this is called the neuro cycle. Neuro, N-E-U-R-O cycle. And with the DNA, um, that's the, what the neuro cycle is called. And so what we did, you can take a screenshot of this. Sorry, I said that all wrong. That's what it looks like. You can get the NeuroCycle on Google Play and iTunes. Everything I teach is scientific. It's like a therapy program. We've got a parent add-on being added to that. So you'll be able to have the, um, like I have a, um, a NeuroCycle for dealing with trauma, a NeuroCycle for dealing with um, parent guilt, and you're all kinds of stuff. That's coming. But currently there's the 63-day program I've developed. I'm going to tell you about the 63 days in a moment. And there's decompression activities, mini neurocycles. So I pretty much I help you do the neurocycle daily over 63 days. Why 63 days? Well, it doesn't take 21 days to form a habit. It takes a minimum of 63 to 66 days. This is part of the research I've been doing for 40 years. And we're doing more, and we're doing more research currently. So people often will stop too soon. And that's why people don't have sustainable change. If you stop at day 21 or day 14 or day 7 when you're working on something, if you don't push through in a specific way for 63 days at least, you won't have sustainable change. Then you get to that point where you recognize, hey, this is where I want to be, but I'm stuck here. I, I know that's where I, I know what to do. I know what's wrong. I know where, but you're stuck. That's because you didn't go long enough. So the neurocycles, all of, all of that inside the app and then also inside this book and then the children's version inside how to help your child clean up your mental mess. As Max put up my social media stuff, I also have a podcast. We have 40 plus million people uh, downloads on the, uh, listening to our podcast because we I teach on these in a very, very practical way. So I know you're being bombarded now, but I'm doing everything I can to help you understand. Because if I can get my biological age, 10 to 12 years younger, just through mind management, and achieve that, it doesn't mean that I'm an avatar and walk around with a smile on my face. I have, I, I allow myself to get upset. I, I acknowledge it's okay to be a mess, but I don't stay there, I manage it. That's the key. It's okay to be a mess. Why am I a mess? And then fix it. And that's what the NeuroCycle does. It's a scientific step-by-step, -step, five step process that you do. It's really simple. It you can put all kinds of your scriptures, your things that you can put everything that you understand into that. We have therapists and doctors and physicians around the world using it and, and doing doing the neurocycle. So in, in conclusion, Matt, can you just put up the um, telomere slide again? I'm sure all of you would like to have your biological age younger than your um, chronological age, okay? And it's a sign also that you will feel a lot more mental peace and be much healthier, etc. So what we did in our research is we showed, uh, we put people, uh, Mac, if you can put up the, actually the head maps, and I'm going to close with this. You're going to see some images of inside a brain, and you're going to see from one of our clinical trials, from one of our, one of our clients, well, I mean one of our subjects, it's coming up now, and at the beginning of the, of the research, day one, they, um, we did all these, they told us their story, we did all these psychological tests, we looked in the brain, we looked at the body, we looked at what we call psychoneurobiology, mind, brain, body. So I didn't just look at the, the mind, we look at all three levels. So what's going on in your cortisol, your homocysteine, what's going on in your brain, what's going on in your life? And look at all of those because each of you are unique in the moment. And what we found in day one of this, uh, the, um, okay, so that's a lot to look at. So just all, each of those is, is the image inside the brain. The three rows um, 
are the different time periods at day one. That this is a person in the, this, the top one is the person, is, one, is, is a subject that went into the control. They never got the neurocycle. The one down here, they got the neurocycle. So just look at the last row, and you'll see the top one where they didn't get any mind management. They got all the testing and evaluation, but at three different time points, but they didn't get any mind management. They just carried on with whatever they were doing. The one down the bottom got the neurocycle, all the, inter all the testing stuff plus the neurocycle. So when we see the blue shade in the brain, it's like a flat line. It means a brain that has got not enough energy and is non-functional. So without mind management carrying on the same way, your brain energy will reflect what you are, um, how, how you are functioning and how you are feeling. And that's not good. You want to change that. This person down the bottom, their brain initially was very, was very blue. They had very high uh, um, inflammation and their telomeres, they were in their mid-30s and their telomeres were, showed that they had a biological age of, an, of someone in their 60s, a sickly person. So their biological age was 30 plus years older than their, uh, than their actual age and it was a sickly older. So they were very ill, they were very suicidal, etc. 60, within 21 days of mind management, their brain started changing. So the color where you, in the last row where you see that color, it shows that the energy is coming, stabilizing. By the day, day 63, that person's telomeres had gone back to their, they had gained 35 years of biological health in nine weeks. So their chronological and biological age matched within nine weeks of mind management. And their brain went from blue to all the different colors, showing that they were learning and managing. So I mean, I can tell you tons more, but I'm out of time. So I hope I've encouraged you. I know it's been a lot, but you are brilliant. You, you can, if you can work your cell phone, you really can understand this stuff. I often say that. It is a lot. Listen again, get the materials, but just remember this. You can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what it looks like inside of you and how it plays out into your future. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.